Hello and welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, where we take a look at fascinating stories about the history of medicine and healthcare. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the story of hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19. The SARS-CoV-2 virus first emerged in late 2019, and we quickly found out that it was 5 to 10 times more deadly than influenza, 2 to 3 times more contagious than it, and it has absolutely no cure. So as it was rapidly spreading around the world, researchers were not only trying to develop an effective vaccine, but they were also looking to see if any of the current medications that we use to treat people for other conditions might also be effective against COVID-19. And indeed, dozens of different existing medications have been looked at, but none has generated anywhere near as much controversy as hydroxychloroquine, which dare I say has now become the most controversial drug ever in history. And even though the pandemic is still ongoing, I think I can safely say that the whole hydroxychloroquine fiasco is solidly behind us as history, so it's fair game for me to talk about as a history channel. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how a few pieces of low quality evidence caused this drug to become one of our earliest hopes in the fight against COVID-19, but then it got caught up in today's extremely politically polarised world and was eventually proven to be ineffective as a treatment for the virus. So the first thing I want to do before we even consider talking about hydroxychloroquine is to answer what initially sounds like a simple question. How do we prove for sure that a drug works? For example, how do we know for sure that you can use aspirin to treat heart attacks or that we can use penicillin to treat bacterial infections? Well, we do know this because we conducted a clinical study or trial. But something that most people don't know and what causes the media to generate unnecessary hype time and time again is that there are many different kinds of studies and that some studies are better than others as you can see based on this pyramid of the hierarchy of medical evidence. Generally, the gold standard for proving a drug works is a randomised placebo controlled trial because you can be fairly certain that bias and confounding factors have been eliminated. As you'll see in this video, many lower quality studies were responsible for increasing the hype of hydroxychloroquine and I'll try to explain the problems with these studies as we go through them. So now that's clear, let's talk a bit about hydroxychloroquine. The history of the drug is a long one, which can be traced all the way back to the 16th century. Basically, when Europeans first colonised the Americas, they also brought several diseases with them, including malaria. But Native Americans quickly found out that the bark of a tree called synchonia happened to be very effective at treating malaria. And the key ingredient in this tree responsible for this was a substance called quinine. A synthetic version of quinine was eventually produced by the Germans during World War II called chloroquine, which was just as effective, and hydroxychloroquine was produced in 1955 as a safer alternative to chloroquine. This drug was extremely valuable in the fight against malaria, but doctors found out that people who took hydroxychloroquine also seemed to have a remission in their inflammatory conditions such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. So now hydroxychloroquine is a very common medication used in the field of rheumatology. So here's where we start to get into COVID-19 territory. Since it has proven antimicrobial effects, as well as positive effects on the immune system, doctors started to wonder whether hydroxychloroquine could also kill viruses. And this has been researched for a very long time, as all the way back in 2004, hydroxychloroquine was shown to inhibit the replication of the original SARS virus when tested in vitro, and indeed, when studies were conducted in February and March 2020 by Chinese researchers, 
They found that hydroxychloroquine also inhibited SARS-CoV-2 in vitro. So before we go any further, we need to discuss what exactly is an in vitro study. It's basically when you extract body cells and then grow it outside of the body in something like a petri dish. You could then introduce a virus into the cell and allow it to replicate, then introduce a drug of your choice into the cell to see if it stops the virus from replicating. Like I said, hydroxychloroquine was successful at stopping the COVID-19 virus. So sounds like good news, right? Let's just call it a day, approve the drug, and end this godforsaken pandemic. Well, not so fast, because there's many reasons why in vitro studies are not considered gold standard evidence. Firstly, the cells used for these in vitro studies are known as viral cells, which are kidney cells that originate from monkeys. And these cells have not just different patterns of receptors on them, but also have a different cellular composition than the human lung cells that the COVID-19 virus typically infects. So the way that the virus behaves in this cell might be completely different. Also, even if it was a lung cell tested in vitro, you still have to consider what will actually happen inside the body or in vivo. Some questions to ask include, Will it be possible to attain the same cellular concentration of hydroxychloroquine in vivo as the one we used to kill the virus in vitro? Or will the SARS-CoV-2 virus just find a different way to divide in the body, independent of the mechanism that hydroxychloroquine is supposed to inhibit it? To sum it all up, here's an XKCD comic which perfectly illustrates the problem with in vitro studies. Also, here's a list of other common drugs that have been shown to inhibit viral replication in a lab, but have failed to treat viral infections when studied on humans. Imagine just how great it would be if taking antidepressants would also give you viral immunity, but unfortunately, medicine just doesn't work like that. So the in vitro study wasn't perfect evidence for hydroxychloroquine's effectiveness. I know it was claiming that it was. That is despite the fact that by March, many hospitals around the world started giving the drug to their patients on compassionate grounds. But then a brand new study was conducted by the prominent French doctor and microbiologist Didier Raoul, which would shoot the malaria medication into the spotlight. This study was published for peer review on the 16th of March and was accepted into an international journal the very next day, which should be raising some eyebrows as the average peer review usually takes at least a month. What the study showed was that compared to controls, patients with COVID-19 who were treated with hydroxychloroquine showed a significant reduction in their viral load after six days. Very positive sounding results. And news of this study reached the USA, who were in the middle of a surprise massive first wave of the virus, so this was news that they really needed. Chloroquine, and some people would add to it hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine. This has been used in different forms, very powerful drug in different forms, and it's shown very encouraging very, very encouraging early results. And we're going to be able to make that drug available almost immediately. Quickly after Trump's positive announcement of the drug, the US Food and Drug Administration approved hydroxychloroquine for emergency use authorization in hospitals. Now, if you have any awareness of what's been going on in the world over the last five years or so, you'll know that whenever Trump gets involved in anything, 
no matter what the topic is, it is guaranteed to eventually dissolve into complete and utter chaos, and this is no exception. But before we get into that, we need to look at this study by Didier Raoul and ask, should hydroxychloroquine have even been approved at all? If you look closely at the study's results, you'll see that it only had 36 patients, 20 were treated with hydroxychloroquine, and 16 were controls that weren't really randomised, as they were simply just patients in a ward that Didier Raoul wasn't looking after. And an even closer inspection shows that 6 of his hydroxychloroquine treated patients were not included in the study, as they were quote, lost to follow up. And the reasons that they were lost to follow up was because 3 of them had to be transferred to the ICU, presumably for increased severity of COVID-19, and one other person actually died. For reference, no one in the control group had died. So basically, this study showed that people treated with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin cleared the virus from the nose faster, but oddly showed that they had worse overall outcomes than the control group. I know we desperately needed an answer to the amount of death that COVID-19 was causing, but I have to say that this unfortunately wasn't quite it. I know some of you might be thinking, okay, it wasn't perfect evidence, but this is desperate times, and we've got nothing to lose by approving hydroxychloroquine in the off chance that it works, rather than just sitting by and doing nothing. Well, let me give three very good reasons why approving an unproven drug can turn out to be a bad thing. Number one, resources used to research other drugs that are potentially effective on COVID-19 will now be diverted to buy up and stock up on hydroxychloroquine. Number two, a massive increase in the demand for hydroxychloroquine might mean that there won't be enough supply of the drug for people with other conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, which hydroxychloroquine is indeed a proven treatment for. And number three, people's mistaken belief that there's a cure might make them to become less cautious about COVID-19, as they'll be less willing to isolate and socially distance, which in the long run, will increase the overall hospital burden and mortality of COVID-19. Well, regardless of this, hydroxychloroquine was officially Trump endorsed, and like I said, that changes everything. Hospital use of hydroxychloroquine exploded, and sales of the drug to the general public increased by over 1000%. There was even an instance where a man in the state of Arizona tragically died after foolishly drinking a bleach containing chloroquine phosphate which is used to clean fish tanks. This goes to show just how impactful Trump's statements can be, despite the fact that he has no medical background whatsoever. As the media frenzy around hydroxychloroquine was going on, more comprehensive research on the drug was happening behind the scenes, and the first key study on hydroxychloroquine was released in April, and it wasn't good news. This study investigated 368 American Army veterans that were treated in hospitals across the nation for COVID-19, looked at whether they received hydroxychloroquine or not, and then checks the records to see the overall outcome of the illness. Well unfortunately, the records showed that the veterans treated with hydroxychloroquine were actually twice as likely to die. Now this was a retrospective cohort study, which is better than a lab study or the French study that just looks at viral clearance, but it still isn't perfect. After all, it wasn't randomised or well controlled, 
so there could be confounding factors as to why patients that were given hydroxychloroquine did worse than those that didn't. For example, if a given hospital had less skilled staff and less advanced equipment to treat COVID-19 compared to the average, perhaps that would mean that instead of being able to perform the high-level critical care for the patients, all they could do was give them a fairly cheap treatment regimen of hydroxychloroquine and pray that it works. Regardless, there would be other retrospective studies on hydroxychloroquine that showed the opposite effect, which people on the other side of the argument could easily point to. But this study on veterans did very little to stop the hydroxychloroquine frenzy, and the polarisation would increase even further when Donald Trump revealed in early May that he himself was taking the drug as a preventative measure after someone working at the White House tested positive for COVID-19. And this is what he said when he was questioned about it. I've had so many letters from people, like the one I told you about, I got it last week. I'll give you, would you like a copy of it? I'd love to give you, if you ask Molly, she'll give you a copy of it. But this is a doctor, he doesn't want anything. I don't know him, never heard of him. But he treats people that are, that we're talking about. And he said out of hundreds of people that he's treated, he hasn't lost one. And he just wanted me to know about it, that's all. This enraged his political opponents, as they claimed that he was promoting an unproven drug which may actually be harmful. But Trump's political supporters doubled down on his pro-hydroxychloroquine stance. And they accused his opponents of not wanting there to be a COVID-19 cure in order to keep the population at fear. But in the words of Anthony Fauci, Having said that, I will state, when I do see a randomized placebo-controlled trial that looks at any aspect of hydroxychloroquine, either early study, middle study, or late, if that randomized placebo-controlled trial shows efficacy, I would be the first one to admit it and to promote it. Well, you can argue about the politics all day long, but at the end of the day, it's the science that talks. And it was in early June where, in my opinion, that we finally got our long-awaited answer about whether hydroxychloroquine really does work for COVID-19 or not. So many people have said that the UK have managed this pandemic dreadfully. But despite this, the one good thing the UK did was to create a system where they could rapidly and reliably assess whether a drug does indeed work for COVID-19. I'm talking of course about the recovery trial, which is a nationwide randomised controlled trial which still is ongoing. The way that it works is that anyone testing positive for COVID in any of 176 different hospitals in the UK would be randomly allocated to receive either one of the drugs being investigated or the usual standard of care, aka the placebo. You would then watch and see whether the patient survives or not. Even though I'm only in my very early years of being a doctor, I very much felt like I was part of some vital, world-changing research. I've never worked in a COVID-specific ward, but there's been many patients in wards that I've been working on that happened to test positive for COVID. And when this did happen, the recovery research staff would come onto the ward, ask for mine or any other doctor's permission to give the medication, and then consent the patient, meaning that we could observe the results in real time. The recovery trial has already given us conclusions for about nine drugs, and this is from studies done in only one country. Imagine if all developed countries decided to organise a study style similar to recovery, we would have known about the efficacy of hundreds of drugs by now, and we would have advanced so much further in our knowledge of how to treat COVID-19. As a side note, the World Health Organization also have a similar multinational trial, but the results of the hydroxychloroquine trial generated a lot of controversy because of data collection concerns. 
Well, hydroxychloroquine was added to the recovery trial in late March 2020, and the results came out in June 2020, but it wasn't good news. The official conclusion was that among patients hospitalised with COVID-19, people who received hydroxychloroquine did not have a lower incidence of death compared to the standard of care. 1,561 patients in the study received hydroxychloroquine, and 27% of those died, whereas 25% died in the placebo group. These results would lead the FDA to revoke the drug's emergency use authorization, and then they would explicitly advise against the use of hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19. This was a huge blow for the drug, and you'd think that should be the end of it, right? Let's just move on and investigate other medications for COVID-19. Well, like I said, Trump was involved, so the roles are completely different. Hydroxychloroquine proponents were now insisting that you need to take the medication just before or very early on after testing positive for COVID-19, just like Trump did. Adding even more fuel to the fire, the Brazilian president Jair Bolsonaro announced that he tested positive for COVID-19 in July and then posted a picture of himself holding some hydroxychloroquine tablets, saying that it was already making him feel better. Well, unfortunately for Bolsonaro and Trump, this was nothing more than a gut feeling as more randomised trials on hydroxychloroquine would eventually come out and show no positive effects with the drug for either pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, or if given in the early stages of the illness. So stern evidence against hydroxychloroquine, but there was still no end to the continued pushing of the drug, and even more fuel would be added to the fire when Donald Trump retweeted a video of a press conference by a right-wing political organisation called America Frontline Doctors, in which they aggressively promote the use of hydroxychloroquine as a complete cure, and said that the scientific evidence against the drug was a conspiracy by Big Pharma. Here's a short transcript of it. I'm here because I have personally treated over 350 patients with COVID. Patients that have diabetes. Patients that have high blood pressure, patients that have um, asthma, old people. I think my oldest patient is 92, 87 year olds. And the result has been the same. I put them on hydroxychloroquine, I put them on zinc, I put them on Zitromax, and they are all well. For the past few months, I've taken care of over 350 patients. We've not lost one. Not a diabetic, not a somebody with high blood pressure, not somebody with asthma, not an old person. We've not lost one patient. The video of course went viral on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube before eventually being removed for misinformation. I don't want to go all ad hominem on this organisation, but a quick one minute background check on the main speaker Stella Emanuel would reveal to you that she has some strange beliefs, like that endometriosis and infertility are caused by sex with evil spirits, or that gay marriage will lead to paedophilia so I don't think we should take anything that she says seriously. But I think the final blow for hydroxychloroquine came when Donald Trump himself was hospitalised for COVID-19 in October. This was right in the middle of the presidential election campaign. And since hydroxychloroquine was highly regarded among his supporters, this would be a perfect opportunity to stir up some support right before the election and take hydroxychloroquine as part of his treatment, right? Well, the list of medications he was receiving was revealed to the public, but hydroxychloroquine was absent from it. But quite crucially, he did receive dexamethasone, a cheap steroid which was previously proven effective by recovery, as well as an experimental antibody cocktail against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which was developed by the pharmaceutical company Regeneron. 
Trump strongly attributed these antibodies to his fairly rapid recovery and lo and behold, it turns out that he was right as the drug has actually been shown in recent randomised trials to improve survival from COVID-19. So at the end of the day, when his own personal health was on the line, Donald Trump chose to listen to the advice of the firm science rather than the advice of social media. Donald Trump himself would never bring up hydroxychloroquine again, but it still is very heavily featured in many right-wing media outlets and pro-conspiracy groups. They keep changing the goalposts by saying things like, you gave too much, you gave too little, you didn't give it early enough, you didn't give it with zinc or azithromycin, you need to give it at room temperature while holding your breath and sat up at exactly 8am in the morning and so on. The fact of the matter is that if hydroxychloroquine did truly work as well as they say, we would have seen it by now. And even if you gave the drug with some magic combination of additional conditions, it's only likely to cause a minor effect at best. And even Didier Raoul, the person who led that initial French study which brought the drug to the spotlight, still continues to aggressively promote hydroxychloroquine as a miracle cure. By the way, he's now being investigated by the French Order of Physicians due to question about his scientific integrity, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this case in the near future. So to conclude, hydroxychloroquine is a very useful medication for diseases like lupus, malaria and rheumatoid arthritis, but not for COVID-19. The whole saga around the drug serves as a perfect example of how in extremely desperate times, the media can amplify something from being slightly promising to being the ultimate solution for a disaster. I wish I could say that I hope everyone will learn from this and from now on we'll exercise a bit of caution when interpreting clinical evidence and touting medication as a cure for a disease. But based on the other drugs that seem to be getting hyped for COVID-19 now, it seems that we haven't learned anything at all. <laughs>